Welcome to the Picademia course on the basics of semiconductors. This lecture covers the Schottky junction. Let's start. By the time you finish this lesson, you will learn types of metal semiconductor junction or Schottky junction, rectifying Schottky junction or Schottky diode, semi-ohmic Schottky junction, forward biasing of the Schottky diode, reverse biasing of the Schottky diode, and tunneling process. In the previous lectures, we saw the ways a PN junction diode and a pin diode operate. What I did not talk about when discussing the PN junction and pin diodes uh, was the two metallic contacts uh, connected to the two ends of the device. In other words, I did not cave into the behavior of the metal semiconductor contacts. Good news is that in this lecture, my intention is to discuss the metal semiconductor contact behavior. In general, a metal semiconductor junction can be used to build a rectifying device or a semi-ohmic contact. A rectifying device made out of a metal semiconductor contact is called Schottky diode. And here is the symbol we use to show a Schottky diode in an electronics circuit. A semi-ohmic contact could be another product of a metal semiconductor junction. The semi-ohmic contact is important since it connects a semiconductor device such as this PN junction diode to the outside world without adding any rectifying effect. Traditionally, a metal semiconductor junction is called a Schottky junction and as explained, it can be semi-ohmic or rectifying. If this is the current voltage diagram of a normal PN junction diode, the current voltage diagram of a Schottky diode looks like this. What this tells us is that the Schottky diode has a smaller built-in and breakdown voltages when compared with a PN junction diode. On the other hand, the current voltage diagram of an ohmic device such as a resistor looks like a straight diagonal line. This implies that the resistance of the device remains intact at any given voltage or current. However, when it comes to a metal semiconductor junction designed to behave as an ohmic contact, what we can see in the current voltage diagram is a curve which is semi-straight, far from the origin but bent around the origin. Since the resistance at all voltage and current levels is not constant. This behavior is called semi-ohmic. Now, what I can ask is that, what does make a metal semiconductor contact a Schottky diode or a semi-ohmic contact? In this lecture, I'm going to address this question. At first, imagine we have two separate bulks of metal and n-type semiconductor. Before I connect them to each other, uh, first of all, we have to take a look at their energy band diagrams. Let's start off from the metal. In the energy band diagram, a metal is characterized by its Fermi level E sub Fm and the metal work function, which is shown by phi sub m. Phi sub m is the energy difference between E Fm and the vacuum energy level. Under the Fermi level, there is a sea of free electrons. In general, the work function is the minimum thermodynamic work or energy needed to remove an electron from a solid to a point in the vacuum immediately outside the solid surface. Hold on a second. What does immediately mean here? It means the electron position is far away from the surface on the atomic scale, but is still too close to the solid to be influenced by ambient electric fields in the vacuum. The metal work function is different uh, for different metals. For example, gold has a work function of around 5.1 electron volts to 5.47 electron volts. For silver, it is around 4.26 to 4.774 uh, electron volts. And for aluminum, it is around 4.06 to 4.26 electron volts. Now, 
Let's take a look at the energy band diagram of the n-type semiconductor. As we already saw, a semiconductor in the energy band diagram is characterized by the balance, conduction, and Fermi energy levels. The difference between the semiconductor Fermi level and the vacuum energy level is called the storage work function, and it is shown by phi sub s. The amplitude of phi sub s depends on the base semiconductor and its impurity density. The difference between the conduction energy level and the vacuum energy level is called the electron affinity and it is shown by chi. The electron affinity is defined as the amount of energy released when an electron is attached to a neutral atom in the gaseous state to form a negative ion. What we can find intuitively in this diagram is that the Fermi level of the N semiconductor is higher than the metal Fermi level. This difference in the Fermi levels is important, especially when these two bulks are connected to each other. If you remember the pressure analogy in the early lectures of this course, you recall that we assumed the doped and undoped semiconductors as gas chambers differently pressurized. We saw that when two chambers or semiconductors are connected to each other, charge carriers move uh, to the other chamber uh, with the higher pressure to the one having the lower pressure. The same analogy applies when the metal and n-type semiconductor are connected to each other. The Fermi levels here can be imagined as uh, gauges of pressure. Since the n-type semiconductor has a larger Fermi level, once the connection is made, free electrons of the n-type semiconductor near the junction enter the metal. The more electrons move to the metal, the more Fermi level of the n-type semiconductor declines. Uh, the electron movement from the n-type semiconductor to the metal slows down once the Fermi levels are aligned. Once the alignment of the Fermi levels happened, a depletion region forms in the n-type semiconductor, but not in the metal. And an electric field directed uh, from the edge of the depletion region in the N semiconductor to the junction of the metal semiconductor is formed. This electric field corresponds to the built-in voltage of this uh, Schottky junction. In the energy band diagram, you can see that the conduction energy level is bent down. The difference between the original conduction energy level and the conduction energy level after the formation of the junction is Q uh, V sub Bi, or the built-in voltage. From this graph, we can simply calculate Q V Bi as the difference between the metal and storage work functions. We already know that in a semiconductor, free electrons tend to remain close to the bottom of the conduction band, or EC. As a result, the free electrons will not be able to move to the metal as long as they are not lifted by an external voltage source that overcomes the built-in voltage. Exactly at the junction, you can see a discontinuity from EC to the metal Fermi level. The amplitude of this discontinuity is Q V sub B. V sub B is the barrier voltage. This barrier voltage does not allow electrons from the metal to migrate to the end semiconductor. Let's bias forward the, this Schottky diode by an external voltage source VD and see what will happen. Let's assume VD is zero at first, so nothing will happen. By increasing VD gradually, an external electric field opposing the depletion region electric field forms. This external electric field lifts up EC of the N semiconductor. Once VD gets equal to the built-in voltage, EC gets flat and free electrons can easily diffuse into the metal. This process is also called thermionic emission. Therefore, hereafter, we have a flow of electron current from the N semiconductor to the metal. 
Since the current flow is predominantly due to, the, to, due to only one charge carrier, electrons, the Schottky diode is categorized as a unipolar rectifier. But what happens when the Schottky diode is reversely biased? Let's look at it. As long as Vd is zero, the diode is in the equilibrium and the energy diagrams remain similar to those of the unbiased diode. Once Vd is negatively increased, an external electric field is formed with a direction similar to that of the depletion region electric field. As a result, EC and EV are further bent down. Now, free electrons in the conduction band are facing with a larger barrier to enter into the metal. In fact, it is more accurate to say that no free electron in the conduction band can diffuse into the metal under the reverse bias. Although electrons do not move from the end semiconductor to the metal, there is another mechanism in place that allows free electrons to move from the metal to the end semiconductor. It might sound a bit strange, especially when the barrier voltage is in place. Anyway, it happens. Under the reverse bias, as I already mentioned, the end semiconductor bands are bent down. Now, this part of the electron C in the metal is in the same energy range as this part of the end semiconductor conduction band. Through a random process, there are moments at which some of the states in the conduction band become available. If there is an electron in the metal in the same energy level and close enough to the junction, it is sucked into the end semiconductor to fill that available state. In other words, the electron tunnels through the barrier to fill that empty state. This process is called tunneling. So under the reverse bias, the reverse current flow is primarily due to the tunneling process. Here is the IV diagram of a Schottky diode. The equation that describes the Schottky diode current density is given here. So far, this equation is similar to the current density equation of the PN junction diode. What differentiates this equation with that of a PN junction diode is the saturation current. The saturation current of a Schottky diode depends on the Richardson constant, temperature, and the barrier voltage. Richardson constant for different semiconductors is different. For example, for silicon, it is 110, gallium arsenic 8, and for silicon carbide, 400 uh, ampere per centimeter squared Kelvin squared. The forward voltage dropped over the Schottky diode can be calculated using this equation. In this equation, the ohmic voltage drop of the a semiconductor is considered. The resistance of the semiconductor can be calculated using this equation. This resistance is proportional to the semiconductor width W sub B and disproportional to the electron mobility and dopant concentration. So far, I've discussed the metal semiconductor junction behaving as a diode but under what condition the metal semiconductor junction behaves as a ohmic contact. Let's take some time to address this question. The main parameter determining a metal semiconductor contact to behave as a diode or ohmic contact is the dopant concentration of the semiconductor. We already know that when the metal semiconductor contact is made, the energy bands of the semiconductor bend down. The area in which the energy bands are curved is called the barrier width. The barrier width mainly depends on the impurity concentration of the semiconductor. The larger the impurity concentration, the smaller the barrier width. To make a Schottky diode, the barrier width must be large enough so that the tunneling current is minimized. However, if an ohmic contact is needed, the semiconductor must be heavily doped so that tunneling process takes place much easier. 
In this lecture, I discussed types of metal semiconductor junction, Schottky diode, semi-ohmic Schottky junction, forward and reverse biasing of the Schottky diode, and tunneling process. In the next lecture, I will cover the light-emitting diodes or LEDs. Thanks for joining this lecture of Picademia.